Hello, microcolony. I hope everybody's well. So I've decided to record three labs or three modules within our biochemistry lab in order for us to be sure that we can maintain a proper pace to finish the lab and the lecture on time. So today I am going to record for you uh, the module on carbohydrate fermentation test, also known as phenol red broth test. We will look at also starch auger hydrolysis and then casein hydrolysis and casein is the major protein in milk. So sometimes the casein hydrolysis test is also known as a skim milk test. Okay. So remember, so this is the beginning of unit two and unit two is really interested in formulating um, a biochemical profile for each organism, right? So each organism, remember we talked about this before, is that each organism really, depending on the nutrients that are available to it, they can bring in those particular nutrients by releasing exoenzymes to the outside of the cell, breaking down the substrate, and then bringing in the smaller molecules to which they can utilize to undergo cellular respiration. But in doing so, then they're going to store certain types of nutrients or macromolecules in their cells. And we're gonna be looking for what does the organism need as a nutrient source? What can it use? And what does it produce as an end product of metabolism, right? And so some of the things we're gonna be talking about today are terms like substrate. Substrate is what can be broken down, what can be used as a nutrient source, right? End product what is made as a product during cellular respiration, right? In order to elucidate that, sometimes we need to add a reagent to uh, the test in order to elucidate an outcome, right? And so a reagent is anything that is added to a test to see an outcome, right? And then also another term we use is we use the term pH indicator. Now, a pH indicator sometimes, like in chemistry, is used as a reagent, but here the pH indicators are already built in to our test so that we can see the reaction as it's occurring right now. Nobody's going to watch a tube for 24 hours straight, but when we inoculate these things and come back in 12 to 24 hours, we can see the end result by just looking at a color change that has developed because of the pH indicator that is being used in the um, in the test, okay? Some of the other terms we used are catalyst, and a catalyst really speeds up reaction but doesn't have a direct effect on the nutrient or the exoenzyme that is being utilized. It's just, it just speeds up the reaction, okay? So those are the major those are the major terms that we use when we talk about biochemistry. And remember, the whole purpose of biochemistry is we try to identify organisms based on their biological profile. Every organism, bacteria, every bacterium that we want to look at has its own biochemical profile. And we want to figure out what these results are and what they mean when we put them in an aggregate so that we can compare them to known dichotomous keys or known tables to figure out what the organism is. Okay, so I hope that was a really good indicate, a really good introduction to why we're doing this, right? Because these are tools, right? These are tools that will you be used with the morphology unit that we just completed. These are tools that will be used, excuse me, <coughs> these are tools that will be used to help us identify the identity of a microorganism and therefore we can have a really good chance of helping our patients, okay? So we'll start with the carbohydrate fermentation test, also known as a phenol red broth test. So if we think about that for just a minute, right, um, the carbohydrate fermentation test can utilize any carbohydrate. But we in microbiology typically have three that we use all the time. And the three that we use all the time are glucose, sucrose, and lactose, right? 
So again, you know, glucose is a monosaccharide and the other two, right, sucrose and lactose are disaccharides, but they have glucose in them. And so we're looking for the ability of a microorganism to use those particular sugars as a nutrient. But we could use any carbohydrate in these particular tests. And we're looking essentially to see what end product do they produce uh, during their breakdown and their utilization of these substrates, right? The test is set up um, in, in a way that you have a test tube with broth in it, and that broth has got a sugar in it, whichever sugar it might be, whichever carbohydrate it might be. Um, it has water in it, and it has a pH indicator. And the pH indicator in here is phenol red. I've got a slide coming up that really allows you to see the differences in, um, in what the phenol red uh, reacts to the different types of pHs, right? But so if you think about that for a minute, um, it's easy to remember because phenol red at acidic conditions, right? At acidic conditions, it's yellow. At neutral conditions, it's red or it's red or orange, right? Like that, right? And at basic conditions, also alkaline conditions, then it's fuchsia, right? Hot pink. And so those are the three types of pH reactions that we see with phenol red, right? So it's phenol red, right? And P we're looking for pH, right? The change in the concentration of hydrogens or the concentration of hydroxyl. You'll notice also that there's a little inverted tube in the test. That little inverted tube is called a Durham tube. D-U-R. H-A-M, Durham. So Durham tube, its sole purpose is to capture metabolic gas, okay? So in order to have a true fermentation, you have to have acidic conditions, right? And you gotta have the formation of gas. So gas will only be produced in acidic conditions, and if gas is produced, it will be captured in this Durham tube, and there will be a displacement of the liquid that's in it, and you'll have this headspace, which indicates that there is um, metabolic gas, okay? So if you have any questions about that, then let me know. But we're going to use this test to help us identify different types of microorganisms, right? So you can see, right, the three sugars that we use are glucose, lactose, or sucrose. Um, but again, it could be any carbohydrate we wanted to look at. And then the pH indicator is phenol red, right? So there's phenol red, okay? And then based on based on what the pH is as the microbe is consuming or utilizing the nutrient and it alters the pH in the tube, then the, there'll be a color change, okay? And so remember that little tube that's in there, a little inverted tube is called a Durham tube and its sole purpose is to capture metabolic gas, okay? So if we look at this then, here you can see that there's some different reactions. So you can see this is orange, right? That's because it's uninoculated. It's really the control. Here you can see that this is um, yellow and it's got metabolic gas right here. So you could say that this is acid and gas, that's true. But the better way to say, you could say it's a fermentation, right? So a fermentation is a presence of acidic conditions and therefore gas formation, okay? But not all organisms are gonna produce a fermentation. Some of them are just gonna produce acidic conditions. And so what you're looking at here with, this is Shigella sony, right? It's actually 
fermenting the sugar in here, but it's not producing any gas, right? And then this is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and this is remaining so that there is no reaction to that. You can see that this is similar, this is similar to the uninoculated tube, right? And therefore you could say, we don't really, in this particular test, we don't say things are positive or negative, right? There are some reactions that's coming up, I'll explain it in just a minute, but there's some reactions we either say that the organism produced an acidic reaction, an acidic with gas, which is also known as a fermentation. We say that the organism can produce an alkaline or basic reaction, or that the organism produced no reaction and therefore the tube remains neutral, okay? So if we go on and talk about this just a little bit more, you can see that here is the setup, right? So there's no, there's no acid being produced, therefore there can be no gas because that's important. Remember, write that down. A fermentation will only happen in acidic conditions. Therefore, if you have no acidic conditions, there will be no gas formed, okay? And you can see the Durham tube indicates it still has liquid in it, and therefore, there is no displacement of a liquid with gas, and therefore, there's no gas, okay? So hence, if you have either an alkaline reaction or neutral reaction, then those are never gonna have gas, only acidic environments. With, with, with organisms that are, that are breaking down substrates, only in acidic conditions will they produce gas, okay? So if we go on, right, I've got a little video that, uh, that here is, is for you, and if you can't see the embedded video, then you can take a look at it uh, later on. I've got, I'll have the link that you can put into your browser and take a look at it, okay? But the reactions are, there are four possible reactions, right? So again, if the media remains orange, there's no change, so it's neutral. The media can, because of the breakdown of the substrate and the production of an acidic end product, right? Whatever that might be, there are lots of acids that can be produced. We're not looking for a specific acid. We're just looking that it becomes acidic. So this science is much more qualitative than say a chemistry cl class when we're looking for a true numbered value, right? Here, we're looking for some qualitative uh, uh, data, right? And so here you can see that media that's yellow is acidic. And then if we have, only if we have acidic conditions, will there be gas formation? And we can say that if that, if that particular, uh, we, a, a and gas, right? If that particular uh, tube has a headspace in the Durham tube, then gas has been produced and the gas has displaced the liquid and therefore you have acid and gas reaction, okay? Also known as a fermentation. And then if, um, if the media turns hot pink, then uh, it will be alkaline. And I'm gonna show you some examples of that in just a second. Okay, so again, if you have any questions, please let me know and I'll clarify for you. So if we look at these, then um, you can see that tube C is the control, right? So this is the control, but now we wanna be able to look at the other, other things, right? The other tubes that are in this, and therefore we can quiz ourselves to figure out what might be go going on, right? So if we look at tube C as an uncontrolled, a, an, an uninoculated tube or a control, then we can compare the other tubes to what you might be seeing. So here, in A, you're seeing you're seeing acid conditions. It's yellow, right? And then you have gas that's been dis that has displaced the liquid in the Durham tube. So this is acid with gas, right? And that is also known as a fermentation, right? Either one of those is correct. So you can either put acid with gas or you can write down fermentation. Either one of them is acceptable and correct. Okay. The second tube um, is yellow, right? Again, if you compare it to the control, here's a control. 
If you compare it to the control, then that's definitely yellow. So this is, but there's no gas in the Durham tube. So this is just an acidic reaction. Mm -hmm. And then if we look at D, D is definitely fuchsia or hot pink. When you compare it to, again, the control, right? So this is a basic reaction or an alkaline reaction, right? And some organisms do that, right? We call those particular organisms um, non-fermenters, or we also call them asacrolytic organisms, right? So asacrolytic, and A in front of sacrolytic means that uh, that they cannot break down sugar, right? That's what that means, right? So if we look then at E, right? So E is the same as C, right? So there's no change in it. So what we say here is that there is no reaction, or you can say that it is a neutral reaction, right? And both of those are correct. Okay, if you have any questions, let me know. Okay, so again, remember with the carbohydrate fermentation test, also known as a phenol red broth test, we're looking for the ability of a microorganism to utilize a sugar, whatever that sugar might be. And it's important to know what it is, but it can be any sugar. And then we're looking to see how the microorganism can utilize it. Because remember, every single microorganism, every single bacterium, has certain enzymes, right? We call those constitutive enzymes. And those enzymes, if they're constitutive, they're already part of the genetic makeup of the organism. And therefore they can break down certain things, but not gonna be able to break down everything. Okay? Again, if you have questions, let me know. And I have uh, for you the video link. So if you couldn't see the embedded video, you can take that put it into your browser and you should be able to see it. You can also go um, to my webpage. It should be there also. I mean, sorry, my YouTube page, my YouTube channel, okay? And as you guys know, um, I always like to end with a little bit of microbiological art and here's a pretty cool one. So uh, take a look at this on your own time. Let me know if you have any questions and I will be more than happy to help you, okay? So now we're gonna talk about another biochemical test. And the next biochemical test we're gonna talk about is the casein hydrolysis test. So you remember with casein hydrolysis, the casein is the major protein in milk. And we're looking to see whether or not a microorganism can utilize that. And if it does break down the casein, then it's going to take away that milky appearance, if you will, right? So it's got that white, cloudy, milky appearance, and the organism that can break down casein will remove that. So if you look at this particular image here, you can see that this has got that milky appearance right here um, where we're looking at it, right? You can see that this has got milk in it, and the milk, looks like milk that has been mixed in to the auger, right? So we had powdered milk. We then took that powdered milk, we put it back into suspension. We um, heated it up just a little bit. We put it through a filter. Then we sterilized the medium and then we added the milk to it very carefully uh, because if we would have just put it into an autoclave, then it would have just caramelized everything and it wouldn't have looked like milk, right? But so you can see in this area over here, it's it looks like milk. But if you look at the, if you look at this area, you can see that there are some organisms growing, right? And those organisms are umbinate organisms. I hope you guys remember what that means. That means it has a raised center, but the organisms when they're growing, they release exoenzymes and the exoenzymes are released radially from the colony. So they're released outwards. And every time, every place they come in contact with 
a substrate to which they can utilize a nutrient source, they're going to break it down into smaller molecules that they can bring into their cell. And so in this case, what you have is you have those organisms breaking down the casein, right? That's the, that's the protein that we're testing for here. It's called casein hydrolysis. Because remember, hydrolysis is the breakdown of molecules by adding water. Enzymatically, we're breaking it down, or, or the organism breaking it down, and then it's clearing that casein when it can be, when it comes in contact with it. Okay? And then this would be, now here we say that this is positive, right? And so we're going to talk about these as we go on. So remember, we're looking for the ability of a microorganism to really break down, to break down the major protein in milk which is called casein. And so if you were to look at these organisms growing on here, right, uh, you can differentiate the organisms. Remember, this is a differential media. We talked about differential media. We, the differential media will allow you to see a color change that happens in the media because of the pH indicator, or it allows us to see an action on the media. And here, the action on the media is that we are seeing a clearing of the major protein and milk casein, right? So if we look at this, everybody will agree that this is positive, right? For the hydrolysis, for the breakdown of casein, this is negative, this is negative, and this is also positive, right? Now, it's a little bit harder to see. You have to be really careful when you're looking at these things as you're evaluating them, because you can see that there is some breakdown. So we don't say that something is slightly positive. It's a binary. It's either negative for the breakdown of casein or it's positive for the breakdown of casein, okay? All right, so let's go back and look a little bit. So if we think about this, casein is a major protein in milk, right? You can see this is one that was made at Riverside. You know it's homegrown because we're not as good as some of these machines they have that make them. But you can see that there are a little bit of air bubbles that got into the media and then those air bubbles have been transferred to the media and they will solidify so that you see these air bubbles in them, right? So if we think about that, then casein itself is too large to enter the cell in order for it to utilize it. There has to be a step-by-step -step degradation or breakdown of that large molecule so that it gets to be smaller molecules. And then you can bring in those amino acids into the cell and the organism can utilize those particular amino acids, okay? So here's a great um, showing of kind of this. This is a, one thing that I found in the lab just by accident. It was, uh, it was an exogenous. Exogenous means it comes from the environment. It's an exogenous organism. It's a bacillus. But here you can see the bacillus landed on this particular, on this particular medium. It started to grow. It released exoenzymes, and it had the ability to break down casein so as these exoenzymes were being released from the cells, from the colony, they, it they were being released radially. And then you can see how the organism really, in a unified fashion, started to break down um, the casein in really a sphere because of the way it's growing and the way that the exoenzymes are released from the colony. Okay? All right, so we're looking for, can the microorganism break down the casein? And so the way we do this is we take a plate and then we take some organisms that we might be interested in, in studying or uh, investigating whether or not they can utilize casein or not. And you can do anything on here, right? So you inoculate the, you inoculate the, the casein or the uh, skim milk hydrolysis test, it was the casein hydrolysis test, you can inoculate it with um, a loop and you can, you can see, you can, this person here, when they did that, they kind of did an up and a back, right? And then here you can see they kind of did an up and then they made a little thingy here like this. But everybody I think can see that this is negative because there's no breakdown of the casein and this is positive because there is breakdown of that casein. So you can see how these things were inoculated, right? Because the organisms grew exactly how they were put on here. And so we would take that, we would inoculate the organisms onto the plate. We would incubate them at about, about 
35 or so. I mean, here it says 25 to 37, depending on what you're looking at, right? Yeast or fungi, they're going to grow at a, at, a, at a cooler temperature, so about 25. But bacteria, the ones that we're interested in studying, are going to grow relatively close. They're going to optimally grow relatively close to our body temperature, which is 37 degrees Celsius, 98.6 for you all who like Fahrenheit. Right. So you take the organism, you'd inoculate on the plate, you put it into the incubator, and you'd come back in about 12 to 24 hours, and you could see the results, right? So here you can see the different results. And so I think everybody will agree that this is positive, that this is positive. And although you see some, you see some kind of an effect here, I'd still call that negative, okay? So we're looking for the ability of a microorganism to break down enzymatically the major protein in milk, which is casein. I have made a video for you guys. Here I am talking about it, and uh, you guys can watch this. It's embedded into this particular presentation, which you'll find under, under lab, under practical two. And if you can't see it, then you can Take a look at it with this link here. You can put it um, onto uh, in, into your browser, and you should be able to see it. Or you can go to my YouTube channel and check it out. Right? And I always remember, I always like to end up with a little bit of microbiological art, and therefore, I decided a snowflake would be <laughs> a pretty cool thing to put in, so especially since we've seen record snow in Austin, Texas. And so here's a pretty little snowflake for you all. I hope uh, I hope you guys are okay and have a little bit of um, the ability to enjoy this weather because we don't see it very often. Okay. If let me know if you have any questions under casein hydrolysis, and I'll be happy to help you understand them. The last biochemical test we're going to do um, for this video. Um, is called the starch hydrolysis. And here we're looking for the ability of a microorganism to break down the polymer of glucose known as starch. Remember, starch is a polymer of glucose. It's typically found in plants, but it's found as a means by which the plants store um, nutrients over a long period of time, right? So potatoes and um, sweet potatoes and beets and uh, carrots, all these things have a lot of starch in them, right? They're really great um, sources of nutrients for the plants, but also for us, right? Potatoes are probably the most fantastic vegetable that there is because they're just so rich in uh, micronutrients, but also in starch, which is nothing more than glucose, right? And so it's really, really great. Now, when you um, were kind of young, you might have known that if you were to put a little bit of iodine and maybe one of your former teachers in, in, in junior high or so showed you this, that if you put a little bit of iodine on some paper, that it would kind of show up as purple, right? Now, iodine itself is kind of a, a brownish, yellowish color, but if you put it on paper, it turned purple, and that's because of the presence of some of the carbohydrates in it. But they all, you also might have done something with a potato where you cut the potato and you put a little bit of iodine on it, and then it showed up as, as this purple color, right? And that's because iodine is used uh, colorimetrically really quickly to discern whether or not there is starch on a particular substrate. And so it's real easy to do that way. So we're looking for the ability of a microorganism to break down starch, right? And so what we've done is we've taken media, we've mixed in that polymer starch into it, and now we have a differential plate and we're looking for the ability of a microorganism, a bacterium, to break down starch, right? If it breaks down starch, then it's gonna break it down into its components, glucose, and then it'll be able to bring that glucose in, which then it can use uh, through cellular respiration, right? So remember, I like to set up my courses so that I'm telling a story the whole semester and the story builds on itself, right? So everything we've learned previously, including cellular respiration, really we're kind of bringing this new information in to talk about how it fits in those 
metabolic schema, right? And so I told you that what we're, we're doing with these biochemical tests is we're trying to develop a biological profile or a biochemical profile for every single organism that we're studying because then we can use that information to identify them, right? And so I've just kind of described the test to you. And so here you have two different organisms, both, both bacillus, this is bacillus megatarium uh, right here. And the other is bacillus subtilis, right? So here's bacillus megatarium and here's bacillus subtilis, right? And you can see both of them are going to be positive. This is positive and this is positive because they they broke down the starch and therefore there's a clearing around the colony, right? So if it would have been negative, then there would have been that that area around the colony, right? And which I'm going to later just really just say it's the A T C, right? The area uh, uh I guess it should be A A C, right? The area around the colony, right? So ATC means something else, but AAC, the area around the colony, okay? So if we then take a look at this, you can see that both of these are positive, right? So again, we're looking to see whether or not a bacterium, um, an organism, right, can utilize starch by breaking it down and therefore it wouldn't be on the media anymore, right? Here is a video for you guys to watch it. I've described the, the process here, right? You would take that plate that's got starch in it you would then, with your loop, you would inoculate the organism and then you would inoculate it at about 37, 37 degrees. It, it says here 48 hours. It can be 24. It could be probably even less than that. Come back. And then what you want to do is you want to flood the plate with the microorganism on that starch auger plate with iodine. Now, you don't want to make it so much that there's a, there's a layer of iodine. All you need to do is cover it with a very thin film or thin covering of iodine, right? And let it sit there for a few seconds and it will react. And everywhere the starch is, it's gonna, the, the iodine will make the, make the color change of that starch auger because it's gonna be indicating that there's starch there. It'll turn it purple or darker, right? But everywhere there's no starch, then it's gonna be clear and there'll be no purple around the colony, right? So area around the colony or that's what I that's what I meant to say when I said ATC, the area around around the colony, right? So if we look at this here, you can tell, right? This is E. coli. It's negative because you can see where the colony is growing here, and there is no clearing around the colony. But but here you have this is a bacillus, right? And here you can see that the area this is the colony here, right? And this is the area that the organism has cleared because it released exoenzymes radially and therefore the starch has been completely hydrolyzed or broken down in the area from where the colony is to where we sit, start to see the purple. Now this will get bigger over a period of time, right, because the organism that can utilize starch will continue to produce exoenzymes to really take advantage of that meat that of that nutrient starch being in the media. So eventually, it uh, this this clearing will extend all the way past here. If this other organism doesn't care, right? But this one can really utilize that starch. And what might really happen is there might be a synergy that occurs because as this organism here is breaking down the starch, it's breaking it down to glucose, and of course E. coli likes glucose. So then E. coli might even start to get a larger, the colony might start to get larger because it's going to be able to utilize the glucose that this other organism is breaking starch into multiple, multiple glucose units. And I think that's pretty cool to think about. Okay, so I have a video for you not I didn't make this video but I have a video for you guys to watch it's embedded in this particular presentation if you cannot see that particular video you can go over and here's a couple of videos you can watch on um, starch hydrolysis right you can take those particular links put them into your browser and take a look at them 
right? So remember, why we are doing this is we're developing a, a biochemical or uh, a bio profile for each of the organisms so that we can identify them. We can help to differentiate them from each other because some organisms can use starch, some cannot, right? And so this is one of the ways that we do this, right? Um, so that we can figure out which organism we might be dealing with, right? Nowadays, everything is done molecularly, so we can do gen probes and things like this, but reference labs and other labs that may not have as much money, they're still gonna use this, this, this technique because it still works, where we have all these um, biochemical tests that we can be that we can be used to to identify microorganisms right and it still works right so it we do it here in this lab because it allows you to formulate information and evaluate how tests are run and then apply that particular information and your understanding of the tests critically using critical thought to help to identify an unknown organism. And we're gonna be doing an unknown organism later in the semester when we start unit three and start to look at differential and selective plates. Um, I will give you an, an organism and then you guys will have an assignment for this, right? So there's really a real good reason why we're doing this because I am building your critical thought uh, skills. And so this is one of those ways we can do this. Remember, with starch hydrolysis test, you're looking for the ability of a microorganism to utilize starch as a nutrient source. And if it does that, it's going to clear the starch from the media. We can check for that by just simply adding iodine. Iodine in the presence of starch turns purple. In its absence, it doesn't turn a color. Therefore, on starch hydrolysis auger, if you add the iodine and there's purple around the colony that that particular organism is negative for the utilization of starch. If there's a clearing around the colony, then that organism is positive because it could use starch as a nutrient source. Okay. Again, if you have any questions, let me know. But here's a little bit of beautiful artwork for you guys. This is actually uh, kind of cool because it's showing some flowers, but there's, I don't know if you can notice it, there's some DNA molecules within the stems itself, right? And so that's kind of a really cool play on biological processes by which we will be studying uh, in this particular unit. Okay, so let me know if you have any questions. That is the end of this particular lab, right? We will um, we will talk, be talking about some other tests in the coming days. In weeks, we'll put it all together and you guys will be able to utilize it to, to conduct um, an unknown uh, project. So let me know if you have any questions. This is the end of this particular uh, lecture or lab. Uh, so Pro-V out. Y'all take care. Bye-bye.